Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn, and today we're getting enthusiastic about plotting vowels. But first, we have a fun new activity that lets you discover what episode of Lingthusiasm you are. Our new quiz will recommend an episode for you based on a series of questions. So this is like a personality quiz. If you have always wondered which episode of Lingthusiasm matches your personality the most, or if you are wondering where to start with the back catalogue and aren't sure which episode to start with, if you're trying to share Lingthusiasm with a friend or decide which episode to re-listen to, the quiz can help you with this. This quiz is definitely more um, whimsical than scientific, and unlike our listener survey, is absolutely not intended to be used for research purposes. <laughs> not intended to be used for research purposes, definitely intended to be used for amusement purposes, and available as a link in the show notes. Please tell us what results you get. We're very curious to see if there are some episodes that turn out to be super popular because of this. Our most recent bonus episode was a chat with Dr. Bethany Gardner, who built the vowel plots that we discuss in this episode. This is a behind-the-scenes episode where we talked with Bethany about how they made the vowel charts that we've discussed, how you could make them yourself if you're interested in it, or if you just want to sort of follow along in a making-of process style, you can listen to us talk with them. And for that, you can go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. As well as so many more bonus episodes that let us help keep making this show for you. So, Lauren, we've talked about vowels before in Lingthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we said that your vocal tract is basically like a giant meat clarinet. Yeah, because the reeds like the vibration of your vocal cords, and you can manipulate the sound in that clarinets can play different notes, and voices can make many different speech sounds. And they're both long and tubular. And we had some people write in that said, we appreciate the meat clarinet, the cursed meat clarinet, but we think the vocal tract is a little bit more like a meat oboe or a meat bassoon, hmm. because both of these instruments have two reeds and we have two vocal cords. So you want to use something that has a double vocal cord? Yeah, I admit I maybe got the oboe and the bassoon confused and I thought that the oboe was a giant instrument. Uh, turns out the oboe is about the size of a clarinet. Turns out I don't know a lot about woodwind instruments. And I think that one of the reasons we did pick a clarinet at the time is because we thought, even if it's not exactly the same, probably more people have encountered a clarinet and have a vague sense of what it looks like than an oboe, which you didn't really know what it was. I had to look up how a bassoon works. And so we thought this metaphor might be a little bit clearer. Yes. However. Okay, there's an update. I have now been doing some further research on both the vocal tract and musical instruments. Okay. And I'm very pleased to report that we, in fact, have an update. Your vocal tract is not just a meat clarinet, not just a meat bassoon. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, most similar to a meat bagpipe. Oh, Gretchen, you found something more disgusting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's even worse. Right. I I can kind of see, I guess, the big bag, a bagpipe made of bag and pipes. Yes. The bag acts like your lungs, and yep. the lungs send air up through your vocal folds as they vibrate to make the sound. So you do have a bag of air, just like in the human speech apparatus. That's a good start. And what I didn't know until I was doing some research about bagpipes, because the you know lengths that I will go for this podcast have no bound, is that a bagpipe actually has reeds inside several of the pipes that extrude from the bag. Because mm -hmm. there's multiple sticking out in different spots. Yeah. There's the one that you blow into, which doesn't have a reed. But then the other ones, there's the one with the little holes on it that you, you know, twiddle your fingers on and make the different notes. Yeah. And then there's also some other pipes up at the top. And they also have reeds in them. Oh. And those reeds are just tuned from the length to a specific level. You know, when you hear someone playing the bagpipes and there's this sort of drone, the... Yeah. The sort of like single note. That's because of the note those reeds are tuned to in the other pipes that don't have the holes in them. Ah. Ah, they're not just decorative. Right. They have this function of giving this sort of harmony to the melody that's being played on the little pipe with the holes in it. Right. 
which is technically known as the chanter, but this is not a bagpipe podcast, despite appearances to the contrary. <laughs> we will link to some people on YouTube telling you more than you ever wanted to know about how bagpipes work if you want to go down that rabbit hole. But if you had an extra pair of hands or two, mm-hmm. or a couple people helping you sort of reaching around your shoulders, this is metaphors getting weirder by the minute. Yep. And you cut a bunch of little holes in the other sticky up the top pipes. You would have less droning and you could play multiple melodies or multiple notes at the same time. Hmm. At the same time. And with this, you could make a bagpipe play something very close to vowels. Ah, cool. (laughs) This is so cursed. I mean, yes, before we even talk about making it out of meat, it's deeply, (laughs) deeply cursed. It kind of reminds me of this instrument from the early 20th century called the voda. Would I pronounce that voda or voder? With the R at the end. Okay, voder. Thank you, convenient rhotic speaker here. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to be of service. It kind of looked like something between a little stenographer's keyboard and a piano, and with a whole bunch of finger keys and foot pedals, you could manipulate it to make something that sounds like human speech. Ah, wow. And this is pretty old? Yeah, it's from like the 1930s. There's a little short wow. video snippet in one of the links in the show notes. So you could sort of play these chords and also have some consonants somehow and end up with something that sounds like a sort of synthetic human voice. Yeah, a lot of the early computer speech synthesis as well was actually quite good at making things that sounded like vowels. It turns out a lot of the consonant things are a little bit harder to do, but the very Uh. basic sound of vowels, as you say, you could play it with just a few bagpipes, very carefully (laughs) re-engineered. I mean, actually, I guess if you're looking for instruments that can play multiple notes at the same time, we could also say that the human is kind of like a meat piano. Right. Or at least you can make vowels on a piano by doing a sufficiently complicated like sequence of weird chords, like notes at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we also have an instrument that's known as the human voice, and humans are very good at singing, and we possibly don't have to engineer all these cursed things to get to that. Okay, so let's talk about the human voice as itself. Yeah. We start with the vocal cords, and the tenseness or looseness of the vocal folds is what produces pitch. Mm -hmm. And then they go through the throat, which we can think of as one tube, and then they go through the mouth cavity, which Mm -hmm. we can think of as a second tube. And each of these tubes bounces around the sound in different ways to add two additional notes, one from the throat, one from the mouth, Mm -hmm. onto the sound that's coming out, which is what makes it sound like a vowel to us. Yeah. And you can map the physics of air moving through the throat space and the mouth space as it comes out to pay attention to the differences between different sounds. And if you're taking like a physics diagram or a diagram of the acoustic signal and saying, okay, which pitches are coming out of the mouth, which frequencies are coming out of the mouth that are being produced by these two chambers, Mm -hmm. then you can see what those are and you can do stuff with those diagrams once you've made them. Yeah. And the seeing bit is spectrograms, which we looked at in an earlier episode and played around with making different sounds and how they look in this way of visualizing it, where you have all these bands of strength and information that you can see vary depending on the different sounds that you make. And that's because of those different ways that we manipulate and play around with the air as it's coming out of our mouth. So the first band that comes out is just the pitch of the voice itself. Mm -hmm. So the lowest one is what we hear as the pitch of the sound. But I can make like ah, and I can make e, and those are the same set of pitches, but on different vowels. Yeah. There's something more than pitch happening there. There's something more than pitch happening. So there's two more notes, sounds that come out at the same time. And if the throat chamber is large, because the tongue is fairly high and far forward, Mm -hmm. then this sound that's the next one after the pitch, which we call F1, is low. Mm Mm-hmm. And then if the mouth is is quite open and the lips are spread, the mouth chamber is quite small, so that sound is quite high. So the next sound, F2, is high pitched. And if you put your tongue far forward and your lips spread, you get E. 
E. And the first of these dark bands is low, the second of them is high, and that produces the sound that we hear as E. Whereas by comparison, if we make the sound oo, the throat chamber is still large because the tongue is quite high. Mm -hmm. But now the mouth chamber is big because we have the lips rounding that make it big. Ooh. So now F1 is low and F2 is also low, and we're hearing the sound ooh. So we have a very clear way of telling from those signals in the spectrogram, if we look at it, the difference between an E and an ooh, even if we can't hear it, we can see it on the spectrogram. And this is where you begin to read spectrograms. Or if we want to start measuring spectrograms very precisely, yeah. we can start doing this. And we can also start seeing, okay, is E when I make it the same as the E when you make it? They're similar enough that we recognize it as the same sound. If we both say fleece. Fleece. You say fleece. I say fleece. Potato, potato. I think they sound pretty similar. Mine is maybe a little bit higher. I've really pushed my tongue forward and up. Yeah. It's a very Australian thing to do. But we can actually record some people making all of the vowels and compare their measurements for these two different bands of frequency and see how similar two people's vowels are to each other. Depending on the quality of your recording, you can see a lot more happening there as well. And they're all the properties that mean that we can tell your voice from my voice or my voice from someone who has exactly the same accent because we have all these other features. And it's very different to if you record, say, like a whistle or one of those tuning forks mm -hmm. that people use to tune instruments because they are giving like a clean single note. Like a pure tone that's just one frequency, one pitch, not several pitches all at the same time that we then have to sort of smush together and interpret as a vowel sound. And that's what gives the human voice its richness. And, you know, if a human voice sings the same note as a clarinet and an oboe, which are definitely two completely different woodwind <laughs> instruments, it's all those extra bits of the things in the spectrogram that you can pick up the difference in the quality or just use your ears, also another possibility. Yeah. But if you want to do detailed acoustic analysis on it, which is kind of fun and can tell us more precise things about the differences between how different people mm -hmm. speak, which is neat, then you have this very precise way of measuring it by converting it into a visual graph chart thing or a vowel plot rather than just like listening to someone and be like, ah, these sound pretty similar. I don't know. I guess they're a bit different. How are they different? Hmm. Sometimes being able to do it with numbers is easier. And in the era before we had computers to create spectrograms and take these measurements, people did use their ear and the best phoneticians have this amazing ability to tell the difference between really, really subtly similar but slightly different sounds. Yeah. And they're sort of so well trained in being able to hear the difference between, oh, you're saying this and your tongue is a little bit further forward than this other person who's saying this with their tongue a little bit further back. But if you're not very good at hearing tongue position out of sounds, you can also produce some stuff and make the machines tell you some numbers about it, which can be easier with a different type of training. When we talk about the position of the tongue and how open the mouth is, we can use a plot to kind of map where in the mouth these things are happening, and that's called the vowel space. And we made a lot of silly sounds when we talked about that many episodes ago. <laughs> Yes. And so the vowel space goes from e -e <laughs> on one side. So that's all up the front of your mouth, and it's just going from being more closed to more open. E to e to a, but you can go through all these sort of subtle gradations between them, and through ooh <laughs> at the back. And that's from all the way up the top at the back to open at the back. Yeah. And you can sort of draw a diagram of this, which is shaped kind of like a square that's been a bit skewed. So it's wider at the top than at the bottom. It's known as the vowel trapezoid because the mouth is not perfectly shaped like a square, like the jaw can <laughs> hinge open. <laughs> Only so far. Only so far. And because this represents how you say or articulate these sounds, this is known as articulatory phonetics. But then because you're articulating a thing that goes into a sound that we can also analyze as the sound itself, these ways that you can articulate things map on to things that show up 
in the sound itself, and analyzing that is called acoustic phonetics. Yeah, because you're paying attention to the acoustic properties, the sound properties. And the really nifty thing is that this vowel chart that we've made from you know, over 100 years ago, linguists before they had computers were like, here's what I think the articulatory properties of the vowels are based on my mouth and my ear and some other people's mouths and ears. You can actually map very precisely this acoustic thing. Once we had computers, you can make them correspond to each other in this way that, you know, you hope it works because obviously people do understand the vowels, but it actually does work when you start measuring things as well. I had always wondered whether it was just a coincidence that the articulation where you put your mouth and the acoustic information about the F1 and F2 with the spectrogram, but explaining it in terms of F1 and F2 are the way you change the shape of your throat and your mouth, that leads to these changes in the acoustic signal. You can see how the articulation and the acoustics come together and you get a similar type of information across both of them. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really neat that there is this relatively straightforward correspondence. There's also, you know, like an F3 that also does other stuff because there's other more squishy (laughs) bits of your mouth. And we're not getting into them. (laughs) There's also a bunch of like flip flopping of X and Y axes that you need to do that Bethany kindly walked us through in the bonus episode. Because those diagrams were created in an era before they were doing the computer acoustics. Like sometimes I think about like the alternate version of what phonetics would look like if we'd started doing it with computers right away and how there's all this sort of analog stuff that's residual Hmm. based on human impressions and how our vowel charts might be completely rotated if we had just started doing it with computers the whole time. But then we'd have to imagine ourselves standing on our heads to say (laughs) anything. So I'm glad they are the way they are. (laughs) That's true. When you're talking about vowels, it's an interesting challenge with English because there's lots of different dialects of English, varieties of English, ways of speaking English. And generally speaking, we're pretty good at understanding other accents. And one of the big factors that accents vary on, though, is the vowels. Yeah. And so if you're getting people to record a word list to do some vowel analysis on, what you might want to do is have them record a bunch of words that all begin and end with the same consonant insofar as possible. Because vowels are very sweet and easily influenced. (laughs) And they're very easily influenced by the consonants that are next to them. And so you have to make sure that they're all kept in line and not influenced by what's happening around them by giving them all the same context. They're very susceptible to peer pressure. Yeah. Uh, So you can have people say something like beat, bet, bit, bot, boot, all of this stuff between B and T. Yep. I learned to record between H and D, hid, had, hood, hod. Some of those words are less uh, frequent, (laughs) common frequent uh, than others, but again, a really consistent environment. But this also obviously causes problems for when you want to talk about the particular vowels in a given accent or in a given variety, because if you go around saying, oh, well, the hoid vowel or something like this, Mm -hmm. how do you know if that's like a Cockney person saying hide or it's me saying hoid or something else because all your consonants are the exact same and there's nothing to let you figure out what the original word is? And someone did come up with a solution for this. And that person's name is John Wells. So John Wells is this British phonetician who I've never actually met in person, but I feel like I know him because I used to read his blog back when he posted more actively. And he used to write his blog in the International Phonetic Alphabet, (laughs) which means that if you read the IPA, you would be reading it in John Wells's voice. You absolutely would be. And this is a challenge that I used to set to myself. (laughs) Sometimes he also wrote in standard English orthography, to be fair. Yeah. But sometimes you just write a whole blog post at IPA and you'd be like, cool, I guess I'm reading this out loud to myself and hearing John Wells's accent and speaking it like him, which was really neat. So in the 1980s, John Wells was like, hey, it'd be really useful if we had a way to refer to sound changes that happen in different English varieties, which often happen to like all of the times you say like the i vowel are a little bit more like this or like that, depending on the accent. I think it was very personally motivated because he was writing a book called Accents in English. (laughs) And it gets very difficult in a book especially, but even in an audio recording to be like the i vowel, the u vowel. Right. And you could use the International Phonetic Alphabet to refer to the specific vowel that people are making. 
But if you want to say people in this area realize this vowel as that, and people in this other area realize the same vowel as something else, how do you refer to that thing that's sort of the macro category of vowel that people would consider themselves to be saying the same word, but the specific way they're realizing it is different? Yeah. And so he came up with what he called the standard lexical sets, which are now also called Wells lexical sets, mm-hmm. possibly John Wells' greatest legacy, <laughs> which is a bunch of words that are crucially easy to distinguish from each other based on the surrounding consonants. So you can say one when you're giving a talk, like you can say the kit vowel or the goose vowel or the fleece vowel, and people know that the kit vowel refers to the specific sound because there's no other like keat word in English that it could be confused with. John Mills was somewhat self-deprecating when he was talking about this. And he's like, oh, I just kind of came up with it like in a week where I had to write this bit of the book. And like, it's kind of weird to think that they're still in use now, but it was based on years of insight into the different ways different varieties of English realize different vowels and the kind of balance he was trying to strike. Yeah, he has this sort of charming blog post from 2010 where he's like, you know, anybody's welcome to use them. I don't claim any sort of copyright. And maybe this is my legacy now, I guess. But he does actually put quite a bit of thought into the sets because they're words that can't be easily confused for each other. So sometimes that means the words are a little bit rare. So you have like fleece and you might think, well, why not use like sheep? Because surely that's more common. People say that. But ship and sheep are very hard to distinguish in some varieties of English. Right. So if you had sheep, it could be confused with ship. Whereas if you have fleece and kit, there's no fliss or keet for them to be confused with. Good nonce words to add to your collection. (laughs) Thank you. And similarly, for people like me, where I make the vowels in cot, as in the past tense of catch, and cot, as in a small bed, the same. So if I talk about cot and cot, people are like, I don't know which one you're talking about because you say them both the same. And I'm like, great, neither do I. You mean when you're talking about cot and court? Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, see, you don't have the cot cot merger. <laughs> Very easy for me, but it's much easier to be able to say thought and lot, much more distinct for me to perceive with you because they don't have merged equivalents. Yeah, thought and lot are much more distinct because the consonants are different. So you don't need to be relying only on the vowels. Mm-hmm. Some of these words are just super fun. Like, can we read the whole Wells lexical sets? There are not very many of them. Sure. Let's take turns in going through each of the words. All right. So you can hear the differences in the way we pronounce each of these vowels. Kit. Kit. Dress. Dress. Trap. Trap. Lot. Lot. Strut. Strut. Foot. Foot. Bath. Bath. Ooh, very different. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We'll come back to that one. Cloth. Cloth. Nurse. My Australian English speaker in me is already immediately, like, prepared for nurse. So, non-rhotic. Very good. Yeah. (laughs) Fleece. Fleece. Face. Face. Palm. Palm. Ooh, very different. Thought. Thought. Also very different. We'll come back to this. Goat. Goat. Bit different. Goose. Goose. Price. Price. Bit different. I have Canadian raising there. We'll get back to that. (laughs) Choice. Choice. Mouth. Mouth. Also, we'll get back to that. Near. Near. Square. Square. Start. Start. North. North. Force. Force. Cure. Cure. I'm only slightly (laughs) hamming up my Australian English diphthongs there. So that whole set with the R's where I'm like, these are just like the same sounds, but now there's an R. You're like, no, these are really different diphthongs. Cure. 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 Taking you on a journey of my whole mouth. (laughs) One thing you could do if you're trying to compare mine and Lauren's vowels is you could listen to us saying them and be like, yeah, those sound kind of different in some places. Yep. But another thing we could do is we could draw some diagrams. And that's what we did. Yes. We were very grateful that Dr. Bethany Gardner, who is a recent PhD in psychology and language processing at Vanderbilt University in Nashville in the USA, took the time to work with us to take recordings of us saying words and plotting the vowels onto a vowel plot. And so now we can look at our vowel plots and compare our vowels to each other. 
We have a whole bonus episode with Bethany about how we made these graphs with them. But for the moment, let's just look at them and compare them with each other and say some things about the results. We sent Bethany recordings of us reading the Wells lexical sets, much the way we did just then. Less giggling, though. We did record them a little bit more professionally. (laughs) But they also used some processes to scrape data of equivalent word recordings from episodes of Lingthusiasm using our transcripts. Turns out, not the use of our transcripts. You can get people to analyze your vowels for you. It's so cool. And so you can see the difference between clearly spoken vowels where we're really focusing on them and then that really compelling influence that other sounds have on vowels that drag them all over the space. Yeah, so I'm looking at the the first set of graphs for each of us, which are the Wells lexical sets, and my vowels are a lot more consistent in them. Like when I make e and e and u, all the points are quite clustered in one spot because we've said everything several times. But I seem to be hitting quite a consistent target there. Whereas when I look at Bethany's vowel plot of me from the Lingthusiasm episodes, there's just way more stuff there, and I'm sort of way more spread out. My vowels are less consistent with each other because I'm producing them in several words. They tested several different words. And I'm just producing them in running speech where things merge into each other a lot more rather than this very clear sort of wordless style. And human ears and brains are so good at disambiguating things that might be very close to each other in the plot, but in a running sentence, we can hear them quite clearly for the words that they are. Right. So like my goose vowel and my foot vowel, goose and foot, are almost totally distinct from each other when I'm reading a word list. Like there's very little overlap in terms of how I'm saying them. Right. But when I'm saying them in running speech, apparently there's a lot of overlap. Because I'm probably saying something like, oh, go get the goose, goose. Yeah. Rather than goose with that really clear ooh. And there's no other word I'm going to confuse goose with. (laughs) Or even if I did, in context, I'd know what thing you're expecting me to go get. Right. Even if I'm saying something like dude, you're not going to confuse that for dud. I'd be saying them in different contexts. The nice thing is you can see, especially from our clearly spoken word lists, that we are speaking A language where the vowels are in a similar place, but there are some slight differences. And you can actually start to get the hang of the differences in the way different varieties of English tend to use the vowel space from this information. So one of the things I noticed about your vowel plot, Lauren, Mm -hmm. and this is a feature of Australian English, is that your kit vowel and your fleece vowel are very close to each other, especially in episode speech rather than wordless speech. Yeah, kit and fleece for me are both really far forward, and you're using other features like length or tenseness to really disambiguate them. People struggle to do it. Or just in context. Yeah. Like I noticed when I was visiting Australia that people would say things like big, and I'd be like, oh, okay, I would say that is big. Yeah, and it's a pretty classic feature of Australian English. It does remind me of one of the most embarrassing times someone misheard me when I was living in the UK. Ooh. And I was talking about how I used to be on a team with my friends for social netball. And this person was not listening that well, and it was a noisy environment. And they thought that I had said nipple. Oh, no! (laughs) Nipple and netball. 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 Whereas I think my I and E vowels my kit and dress vowels are pretty distinct from each other. They don't really overlap. Whereas all of Australian English is really far forward. It tends to be quite high. And that British English speaker, I don't know what sport they thought we play in Australia. (laughs) Uh, But there was a moment of deep confusion. These are the types of things that you can find out when you sort of get your vowels done. The way sometimes people, you know, I think there's a trend on Instagram right now to get your colours done. You find out whether you're a winter (laughs) or a soft spring or something like this. I'm an Australian English kit fronting. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, What are your vowels? What does this say about where you're from? Is there anything you noticed about mine? Uh, I think for you, like, definitely what becomes clear is that court cot version, or as I like to think of it, the 
gone gone merger. Oh, the gone gone merger. I can tell if people have it if my name and the word gone sound the same. And the past participle of go. So it's very salient for me. And like the cot court merger is so famous, people don't use the well set terms for it. They just refer to it as court cot. But you could also call it like the thought lot merger or the lot thought merger. I never know which one goes first because I literally just think of these as being set the same. And you can see evidence. We're not imagining that you're merging them. You are physically merging them in the vowel space. I'm literally saying them as the same thing. So I was always confused about the thought vowel when I was learning the International Phonetic Alphabet because I was like, I can't figure out how to make a sound that is somewhere in between this sound in lot and thought doesn't go all the way up to the O in goat. Like, it doesn't feel like there's really anything between them for me. And that's true. So the vast majority of Canadians have thought and lot merged. Yeah. But unlike at least some Americans, we don't have them merged low. We have them merged high. Ah. So I have thought and caught. And in order to produce the other vowel, I had to actually produce something lower in my throat, like thought and cat, thought and cat, which (laughs) sounds very American to me. I had to produce this lower sound because there was no space between thought and goat. They're very close to each other. And in fact, the thing that I wasn't producing was ah, the really low one. That sort of dentist sound. Yeah. Movements and mergers can happen in all kinds of different directions. The merging of cot and cord also explains why it took me a very long time to understand that podcast is a pun because it's meant to be a pun with broadcast and pod and broad. Podcast and broadcast is the same vowel for me. Whereas it works as a pun for you. (laughs) So that was very satisfying to learn. That's why that's meant to be a pun. The pun that I didn't get based on my accent, and this is to do with the price and mouth vowels, I didn't realize that I scream for ice cream was supposed to be a pun. Oh, because the raising that you have in Canada means that it doesn't work that way. Whereas ice cream for ice cream. Right. You have the same vowel in those. Yeah. Or the same diphthong. But for me, I scream for ice cream. Those are very different. And so in choice and price, I have different vowels than I would have in choice and prize if choice was a word. Bok choice. Multiple. Bok choice. Yeah, several of them. (laughs) And prize. Returning to podcast, but moving to the other end of the word, cast cast as a distinction is so famous in mapping varieties of British English Mm. that people talk about bath trap distinctions all the time. Uh, Yeah, I hear of it as called the bath trap split. Yeah. But as you can hear the bath trap split, I just say them both the same. Whereas in Australia, Victorians traditionally would say castle-like trap, Mm -hmm. and people further north and in the rest of the country would say castle. Like bath And so whether you're a castle or castle shows this bath trap split as well, to the point where in New South Wales you get the city of Newcastle, but in Victoria you have the town of Castlemaine. Ooh, this castle distinction from the trap bath split. I think sometimes when I'm trying to do like a fake British accent, Mm -hmm. I will just make all of my traps and baths into traps and bath. Right, okay. You you know there's something <laughs> happening there and you haven't quite landed because it does vary. Well, then they're not different categories for me. Yeah. Because it's all one category and I push them all forward rather than, you know, moving half of them because I don't know which half to move. I find it very satisfying listening to No Such Thing as a Fish because they talk about the podcast or the podcast and their guests do depending on whether they're from Southern England or more in the Midlands and North, where they tend to say cast instead of cast. I have literally never noticed this distinction. I've also listened to many episodes of No Such Thing as a Fish, because you made me start listening to them back in the day. And I've never noticed that they say anything different because it's just not something I pay attention to. (laughs) It's so salient for me as a Victorian English speaker that I notice it all the time. And there would be a really fun mapping variation activity to do listening through to fish. Turns out I just listen to it and don't get distracted by that too much. Well, you know, if you want to commission Bethany to make graphs of their vowels, (laughs) uh, I'm sure that's an option. (laughs) I love how Wells' lexical set has just entered, in many ways, you know, the bath trap split. It means you get all these other terms like goose fronting, which is just great as a term. I love how vivid these words are, you know, things like fleece and goose and goat, like they're very sort of 
common animal nouns that are quite vivid. <laughs> yeah. And there are definitely linguists who have dressed up as Wells lexical set items for Halloween. It makes a great oh. group Halloween costume. Oh my gosh, my favorite one of these was from North Carolina State University, and they got like the whole department and they each dressed up as one member of the Wells lexical set. So someone was a kit, like they dressed like a cat, and someone dressed like a goose, and someone dressed like a cloth or a fleece. Uh, and then they stood in the positions to create the vowel diagram, and they posted a photo on the internet, and you can see it, we will link to it, it's really great. <laughs> Magic. You and I also once had a project where we plotted Wells lexical set using emoji. That was your project. <laughs> I did the making the joke. You did the graphic design. It was a good team project. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I feel like I remember you being the instigator of this. <laughs> Shenanigans were were shenaniganed. So yeah, you can you can get a goose emoji and a goat emoji, uh, and you can map the vowels in there as well. And goose fronting, because we're talking about you know moving the tongue further forward or back or up and down in the vowel space. And yeah, I have quite fronted vowels as an Australian English speaker for my front vowel. So goose, yeah, I've already got it quite far forward compared to you. You can see that in the diagrams. I think my goose, <laughs> my goose is also cooked. My goose <laughs> is also fronted. Because <laughs> I think Canadian English is also undergoing goose fronting. Like there's a lot of different regions yeah. that are all sort of simultaneously fronting their geese. No, not their geese, fronting their gooses. Fronting their gooses. I feel like the really stereotypical example is from California. Particularly in the lexical item, dude. Dude. Sort of like a surfer pronunciation of dude. Dude, you're a fronted goose. If you compare that with like dude, which would be less fronted, dude sounds like you're more of a fuddy-duddy and dude sounds like you're so cool. Yeah, I mean, there are other things happening there as well, because I found a paper while researching this where someone looked at 70 years of received pronunciation, which is that incredibly stuffy British, like old fashioned newsreader voice. And apparently goose fronting is happening in that variety as well. Oh, so if the queen was still alive, she'd be fronting her goose as well? Quite possibly. Gooses are being fronted all over the place. <laughs> all over the English speaking world. So one of the things that can happen if you're getting your sort of vowel tea leaves read mm -hmm. is you can say things about region. Another thing that looking at a vowel plot can do, because vowels just contribute so much to our sense of accent, is it can say things about gender. And one of the cool studies that I came across about this is there are studies of kids. Yep. So people often assess someone's gender based on their voice. Mm -hmm. If someone's on the phone, you may have an idea of their gender. You may also have an idea of their age. Yep. And Part of this is based on vocal tract size. So kids' voices are high-pitched because kids' heads and throats and larynxes are smaller than adults. And the cool thing is there's no gender difference in that until puberty. People who go through a testosterone-heavy puberty tend to grow larger vocal tracts and tend to have deeper pitches. I mean, not in the scheme of things where they're so completely different. There's so much overlap. Yeah. But we're really tuned into these subtle differences. But before that age, anything that kids are doing different, it's nothing to do with what's happening with the meat pipe and everything to do with what's happening with the like social performance of gender, which is to do with your culture. And so even at age four, when there's really no physiological difference, mm -hmm. age eight, when there's really no physiological difference, you can see that kids are producing their vowels somewhat differently mm. in a difference that increases with age based on their gender because they're culturally acquiring this is what it means to feel like a boy, this is what it means to feel like a girl, and they're doing gender with their voices even when they don't have the vocal tract changes reinforcing that yet. Cool. Yeah. So you can see that there are differences at age four that sort of increase with age and increase up to age eight and 12 and 16 and get more distinct from each other. The other thing is, once people get a bit older in sort of teenagehood and adulthood, mm -hmm. there are gender differences in vocal tracts. And the general finding with gender differences in vowel plot size. So we've been talking about having some vowels be more front or some vowels be more similar to each other. But the overall finding when it comes to gender is roughly that, at least in English speaking environments, men tend to have all of their vowels more similar to each other more towards the center of the space. Specifically, cis straight men tend to have vowels that are all more towards the center of the vowel space. Huh. And everybody else, so cis straight women, gay men, 
lesbians, trans people of all genders, non-binary people Mm -hmm. use way more of the vowel space. Straight men, you're missing out. (laughs) Like, cis straight men are doing this one very specific thing with sort of buying into hegemonic masculinity of vowels, where, like, they're not wearing interesting colors and they're not doing interesting vowels. Hmm. <laughs> and there was one quote from one of the studies that I read where they had one cis straight man who was, like, an anomaly in the, the list of not doing this very centralized vowel thing. And he's like, yeah, you know, sometimes people hear me and they think I'm gay, which I'm not. I'm just sort of a nerd. I don't really do that macho stuff. So Aww, people... It's nice they asked him. <laughs> yeah. People just perceive my vowels as like, whatever, I don't really care. I'm not trying to like, do that thing with my vowels. <laughs> Fascinating that like the social discourse was enough that he had been made aware of it. Yeah. And that sort of doing anything out of that little man box of the very small set of vowels was enough to get him thinking, oh, yeah, well, it's because I don't buy into this particularly narrow view of masculinity. Fascinating. And I should say, like, you flagged English there, but that's because we need more of this work in English. We need more of this work across the world's languages, there's so much to be done about the social dimensions of vowels. Right. And a lot of the early work in especially gender and vowels has this very sort of essentialist framework of like, we found the male vocal tract, we found the female vocal tract. And there's a recent study by Santiago Barreda and Michael Stewart, which I got to see at the Linguistic Society of America last year, Mm -hmm. where they were looking at sort of what are the vowel differences between genders and can we actually characterize these more precisely? And they found that the biggest thing that affected vowel spaces was actually related to height. Hmm. So like taller people have more space in their vowels, deeper voices. Makes sense. They've got more space for their bigger meat pipe. It's more of a yeah. bassoon than an oboe, Gretchen. <laughs> taller people have a bigger meat pipe. And then in fact, the relationship between height of your whole body and size of your meat pipe is very linear and doesn't have a sort of categorical distinction for gender. But of course, if you collapse this into two different buckets labeled men and women, you'll find on average that men are taller than women on average. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are lots of individual people who are exceptions to that, and it's much more of a variant thing. So similarly with some of the research on sexuality, some of the early stuff is like, oh, do gay men or do lesbians have like different shaped vowel tracks from like a, you know, physiological perspective? The answer is no, this is cultural. Right. Yeah. But the finding, the finding keeps being reported in terms of like, oh, well, gay men have more extreme vowels in various places, especially with trap being produced further away from the center of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Lesbian women tend to have further back sounds for palm and for goose. Right. Or sometimes they're intermediate between male and female targets. But again, this seems to very much be cultural. Uh, the bi women, some studies found they patterned with the lesbian women. Some studies found they patterned with the straight women. Hmm. No one knows what to do with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one study I found on bi men found they patterned with the gay men. But again, maybe other studies would find something different. There's a paper by Lal Zimmon mm-hmm. about trans men's voices being perceived as quote unquote gay after they go on testosterone. Right. And he finds that it's not quite the exact same as the cis gay men, but it's also because it seems to not be in that man box, people are just parsing it as gay. So many cultural attitudes coming to bear on vowel spaces. Studies on trans women's vowel spaces uh, is often fairly dominated by like the speech pathology literature, Mm. which is about specifically sort of vocal training and trans women really trying to make their voices sound different. But it still finds that they're not doing the same thing as either cis women or cis men. Right. Again, lots of cultural factors at play there. Anything about our non-binary pals? There is a recent dissertation by Mm -hmm. Jack Jones, and they find that basically non-binary people do whatever the heck they like. I love it. (laughs) Which is, again, not exactly the same as anybody else. They could just keep doing whatever they want. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff on gender and sexuality, especially in terms of like dispersion of the vowel space and regional stuff in terms of specific things being closer or further from each other. There's so much happening in vowels in terms of plotting them all in this space in the mouth, but also so much happening in terms of plotting them in the social space. And this is what makes vowels so rich and so interesting. I feel like when we're talking about vowel plotting, there's this aspect of like, I am putting my fingers together and plotting. 
Uh, which is maybe the fact that vowels do convey so much social information about who you are, where you're from, that you can sort of make plots about people when you know what their vowels are. So if we were going to make a meat clarinet or a meat bassoon or even a meat bagpipe. Oh, dear. (laughs) I'm so sorry. We would not only want it to be able to convey the sort of basic vowel chart, And one of the reasons why I think these sort of synthetic versions of the human voice often sound so weird Mm -hmm. is that they don't have all of this additional demographic information, regional information, gender and sexuality information that's also so important to our experience of vowels. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, including visualizations of our very own vowel plots, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all the podcast platforms or Lingthusiasm.com. You can get transcripts of every episode on Lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including the IPA, branching tree diagrams, Buba and Kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch like Etymologies and Destiny t-shirts and aesthetic IPA posters at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Links to my social media can be found at GretchenMcCulloch.com, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. My social media and blog is Superlinguist. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Our most recent bonus topic was a chat with Dr. Bethany Gardner, who built the vowel plots we discussed in this episode. We talked to Bethany about how to do vowel charts and how you can plot your own vowels, or you can just learn about how they did it for us. Think of it like a little behind-the-scenes episode on the making of this episode. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gon, our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirella, and our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens, and our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. <laughs>